Fellowship is the unity that God demands. Notice that in the theme, the last word is demands. It's not something that's left up to us to achieve it if we want it or if we don't want it, we don't have to. If heaven is to be our home as Christians, as that term is used and defined in the scriptures, then there is a unity that is taught in the New Testament that God demands. If he demands that one obey the plan of salvation, and that one is baptized into Christ for the remission of past and alien sins to become a Christian. Just as surely as that is taught in the scriptures, then there is a unity that God demands. It is not a unity in diversity, that is, where we all agree to disagree over matters that God says you must believe and you must obey. So we are interested in hearing the truth on this and in the time we have in this lectureship, we've divided it up in topics among our speakers. Our first speaker this morning is Brother Weldon Blake. He was born in Willis, Texas. He's married to the former Darlene Simmons. They have two children, Wayne Blake, who just led us in prayer, and Cindy Paluca, five grandchildren, and one great-grandson. I wonder who that is. Weldon is currently serving as an elder at the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas, where he and Darlene are two of the original members of the congregation that was established in 1994. That was a year after I came here, and I remember that very well. Didn't know we would build the relationship that we have, but we're grateful for their love for the truth and the practice of the same. Weldon preaches where needed. He teaches Bible classes, and he leads singing. He's taught first grade through adult Bible classes, including 20-plus years of prison Bible classes. He would have gone longer, but he'd served his time at that time. <laughs> he is a graduate of Montgomery High School and the University of Houston, and he will be speaking to us today. We want everybody to have their Bibles open take notes. On this, give diligence to keep the unity of the faith and the importance of love. Please come speak to us, Brother Wilton. It is uh, an honor for me to be able to speak with you on this lectureship. I have uh, I wanted to express my appreciation to the spring congregation and the elders here, Brother David Brown and Ken Cohn and John West, for inviting me. The, uh, I appreciate the strong stand that you've taken uh, for the truth over the past few years, the past years, I shouldn't say few years, and the, uh, the battles that you've fought and are continuing to fight. I couldn't help but think when David was talking about the uh, uh, security measures, you lock the doors to keep people out. When I was at the Ellis unit, we locked the doors to keep them in. And I had literally had a captive audience. They couldn't leave. If they didn't like my preaching or my Bible class, they were stuck. <laughs> <clears throat> As David mentioned, our theme for this lectureship is the unity demanded by Christ based on Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. And since I'm the first speaker, I thought I would take the time to read those verses to, to start us out. Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, and one Spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. As Brother David said, my particular topic is give diligence to keep the unity of the faith and the importance of love. And I thought I'd start out this morning with uh, just making sure we have a good understanding of the terms, definitions in other words. 
Diligence, of course, is pretty simple. We, uh, we don't have much problem with that. But to give diligence is to be zealous, to give careful attention to, uh, devoted, painstaking effort to accomplish whatever it is that you're undertaking. Colossians 3, verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, uh, and not unto men. Whenever you're, whatever you're engaged in, but especially when it's spiritual matters, you can't be half, half-hearted half about it. You can't be lukewarm about it. And keeping the unity of the faith is not something that to be entered into with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It requires conviction, interested in persevering application, devoted painstaking effort to accomplish what's required by the Lord. Revelation 3, 16 so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's the way God looks on a lukewarm Christian. The second term is to keep. To keep would imply, of course, that you already have something, but you're going to, uh, to guard it, to keep it in custody, uh, to preserve it, protect it. And when we're added to the Lord's church, we become a part of that unity of the faith. And it's incumbent on all of us then to keep it, to adhere, adhere to it, to attend to it carefully. Don't change it and don't lose it. Now the, the unity, of course, unity is um, oneness, agreement, concord, harmony, symmetry. The word unity basically means oneness, and it's used in contrast to the parts that make up the whole. So our entire lectureship uh, this uh, day is going to be of handling those individual parts that make up the whole, which is the faith. The term, the term faith is used in different senses in the New Testament. Frequently, uh, we see it employed as subjectively, meaning it has to do with one's personal uh, beliefs the faith that abides in the Christian's heart. At other times, we see it used in an objective sense where it's talking about the entire gospel system, that body of doctrine to which one must submit. And that's particularly true when, uh, when it's referenced as the faith. So the faith is that new covenant. It provides us unity of doctrine. It's referred to in the scriptures by various terms. The new covenant, the truth, the new testament, the word of God, the doctrine of Christ, the gospel, the oracles, as well as the faith. And evidently it's called referred to as the faith because it is that source which produces faith in the heart of the individual. Romans 10 verse 17. I want to just look at a couple of different ways that the scriptures refer to the, the faith. Beginning in Colossians 1 verse 23. It says, but they had heard only, talking about Paul of course, that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith. He preaches the faith which once he destroyed. In Acts 6 verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and the great number of the, the priests were obedient to the faith. And Jude, verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common faith, it was needful for me to write unto you and uh, exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. You see, from these three passages, the faith is that body of truth that can be preached, Galatians 1.23. It can be obeyed, Acts 6, verse 7, and it be, can be contended for in Jude, verse 3. Now, how much of it has to be contended for? How much of it has to be obeyed? All of it. There is no facet of the faith that is non-essential. It is that entire system of Christianity which 
determines the salvation of those who embrace it. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, tells us that Paul was confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, that through many tribulations you must enter into the kingdom of God. The one thing is certain, people cannot share a common faith unless they are united in affirming the one faith, that one faith system, rather than the diverse creeds of denominationalism. Now we've looked at each of those terms, but now what is the unity of the faith? What do we mean by that? I'd like to first start out by reading what Jesus said about unity to begin with. In John 17, verses 9 through 11, I pray that for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, Jesus prays for the unity in the kingdom. So obviously, he does not consider that to be an impossibility. And he provides us with a body of teaching whereby we may all be united. Whereby we will be saved if we believe and obey it. Now, God has not only taught us to be united, told us to be united, prayed for us to be united, but he's also given us a plan for that unity. It's implied throughout the Bible, but it's very simply stated in Philippians 3, verse 16. It says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. If we walk by the same rule, we'll be united. If some walk by one rule of faith and some by another rule of faith and some by another, the end result has to be division, not unity. We must all be governed by the same standard or rule. Now, if that unity which Christ prayed for ever comes about, it will be when men lay aside the creeds and manuals and disciplines and catechisms and all of those things written by men and get back to the Word of God. You get back to that faith that's preached, that's taught in Scripture. Following the standards and rules drawn up and adopted by men will never bring about the unity enjoined by Christ and the inspired apostles. Only following the Bible will accomplish that. John 17, verse 17 Jesus said there, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The truth of God is objective. It means it's not influenced by personal feelings. It's not influenced by interpretations or prejudice. It's based strictly on the, the facts and is totally unbiased. The truth of God is infallible, meaning it cannot be wrong. There are no mistakes in it. The truth of God is unchangeable. It cannot be changed. It will always be the same. Knowing these things about the truth of the Bible which should give us absolute confidence in the, in the Scriptures. Truth is truth and will always be truth regardless of what man's attitude toward it or ignorance of it. Now some claim you cannot know the truth. But I read in John 8, 32, where Jesus says there, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And furthermore, in John chapter 12, verse 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word which I have spoken, the word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now my God is a fair and just God. And he wants everyone to be saved. So he's not going to give me a book that I can't understand. He wouldn't be fair and just if he did. I was just thinking if, uh, if I wanted to learn to play soccer or want referee soccer, I guess they have referees, and I asked for a book of rules and you gave me one written in Latin, 
That wouldn't work. I can't understand it. Don't know what it means. Our Bible is not that way. You don't have to have someone to explain it. It's there, and it doesn't change. And so far as God's truth for men today, if the New Testament teaches it, then it's truth. If the New Testament doesn't teach it, then it's not true. And many passages emphasize the fact that we must not go beyond what is written. We must not fall short of what's written. We must not seek to change what is written. And we must not seek to make substitutions for what's written. We must not treat the Word of God with indifference. The truth is revealed to us through that body of truth revealed to us in the gospel or the truth. Now, if it is that that body of t truth teaches us how to be saved, you can see why it's so important then that we not tamper with it. The re that's the reason we have scriptures like uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. In Revelation 22 and uh, verse 18, it says basically the same thing. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. Let's consider the um, importance of love just for a moment. There are three Greek words in the, uh, uh, the King James New Testament. Three words and their derivatives, I guess I could say, that are translated love or in some cases charity. They are storge, phileo, and agape. And I know there are different ways to pronounce those. That's my way. <laughs> the um, storge love is what we would consider a family love, love for parents, children, uh, those in our family, just our natural relatives. And this is a word that's used in Romans uh, 12 and 10 in conjunction with phileo love, where it's translated be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, uh, preferring one another. Now, two true Christians are to have an affection for each other, much like that expected in a family. You have a different feeling for your blood brother or sister, or mother and father than you do other people. Well, we in the Lord's church are family. And we should have that kind of a, a, a family love for those in the Lord's church. Now, the second word translated love is phileo, meaning to have a special interest in someone or something, brotherly love, love of brethren. Basically, the, it's friendship. And, that, of course, that's where you get, you know, the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The um, uh, love pertains to a great liking or a close friendship, just our friends. And, you know, friends are great, but so is family. But then that third Greek word that's translated love, or in some cases charity, is agape. And this is the highest form of love and the love most often referenced in the scripture. While storge and phileo emphasize feelings and, and emotions, agape love emphasizes actions. And unlike those other two loves, those can be hidden in the heart. You may, you may not know that I love you as a brother because I may not tell you. But if I have agape love for you, that is going to be demonstrated. It's going to be demonstrated in what I do and say for you that's beneficial to you. Agape love is not more than a feeling. It is a feeling, but it's more than a feeling. And it's a supreme love because of what it does and not just what it feels. So agape love is not an influence, an impulse, just suddenly feel like doing something. <laughs> now you can have storge love, that's family love. You can have phileo love, that's friendship, without having agape love. And let me demonstrate. 
Have you ever heard a parent say, I love my child too much to discipline? They do love their child. In fact, they may storge love that child. They may phileo love that child. But they don't agape love the child. Because agape love would have them to discipline for the child's good. They don't have that love for the child to do what's best for the child. They just have that good feeling about the child. You have situations. We've had so many here in the last couple of years. We have a brother or sister involved in sin that will not repent. And some would say, I love that person too much to discipline them. And they may not say that in words, but they'll say it in deeds, in their actions. And it's true, you may have that storage of love for that person. You may have that phileo love for that person. But you don't have the agape love that God commands you to have for that person. Agape love will have you to do things sometimes that are unpleasant. Some things that you don't want to do. And that's what we get into with this fellowship issue. Is some of these are so difficult, we just don't want to do it. But if you have agape love that's commanded by God, you're going to do what's best for that person. And what's best for that person is to save their souls. Now God commands us to agape love our enemies, even in Matthew, Matthew 5, 44. This love for our enemies, again, is not motivated by a good feeling about them. It's not because they're a friend. It's not because they're family. But because of a commitment we have to do what's best for that other person. That's that agape love. Seeking that person's long-term benefit. Because of his love for mankind, God gave his son to be sacrificed for our sins. And Christ loved us with that same agape love that he gave his life so that you and I would have the opportunity to be saved from the consequences of our own sins. The Heavenly Father and his Son did not do this because it felt good to do so, but because of agape love. The love God possesses for man was, who was created in his image is agape love. The very nature of God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, Beloved, let us not love one another. Let us love one another. For the love of God is, and everyone that loveth God is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that he might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. In each case, that love that's talking about there is this agape love, that highest form of love. We need agape love because some of the things that God requires of us are not enjoyable. They are easy, but they need to be done. We need phileo love because we need true friends, friends who can sympathize with us, who can... Uh, with whom we can share our feelings and uh, emotions about topics. And we need storge love between us as family members. We're all part of the same family. That's why we can say that we love brethren in uh, foreign countries. We haven't met them, but we have a love for them. That's the kind of love that we're talking about here is that brotherly love. They're our brothers just as if they were blood kin. Love is the glue that holds together all of the parts that make up the faith. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses uh, 13 and 14, it says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, 
Quit ye like men, be strong. Let your things be done with charity or love. And Jesus said in John 14 and 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And above all these things, Colossians 3, 14, Above all these things put on charity or love, which is the bond of perfectness. That's the final Christian grace. It culminates and combines the others and without love, all the others are futile. First Corinthians chapter 13, that great chapter on love, the first three verses, Paul writes there, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have a gift of prophecy that I may, and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In every case, we're talking about agape love. If you don't have that, all of your actions are null and void, if I can say it that way. You drop on down to verse 13 in that same chapter. And now about a faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, I know I spent most of my lesson on defining what we're talking about, but it still points you in the right direction where we're going. So uh, now we'll just we'll get to my topic. <laughs> it says, give diligence to keep the unity of the faith and the importance of love. So what's involved in doing that? The thing we started out with was being zealous, diligent. Be diligent to go about doing any of the work of the Lord. But you know, many times I'm, I fear that we're put to, put to shame by the denominations, by their enthusiasm for spreading their doctrine, a, a false doctrine. Should we not be equally enthusiastic to spread the truth to, to keep the unity of the faith? Uh, you see the sports teams, the Houston Astros, the Houston Texans, the Houston Rockets, and you see fans going to their games and they're, they're wearing the team colors and they're jumping and screaming in excitement. And I think, you know, we need to have a little bit of that excitement in the Lord's work. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not uh, advocating we're, we're going to be dancing in the aisles in, in, in our assembly, but rather just a little bit of that enthusiasm. Just like with the Apostle Paul, whenever uh, he, in Acts 17, verse 16, when he was in Athens, and uh, he said his spirit was stirred within him when, saw, when he saw the city given wholly to idolatry. Is your spirit stirred within you when you see biblical ignorance around? You know, we see so much, especially now if you get on uh, the Internet and Facebook and that sort of thing, you see so much biblical ignorance. But there's biblical ignorance in the Lord's church too. But it needs to stir us to want to, to do more, to, to educate we need to be careful to preserve, to keep that unity of the faith. By that I mean don't add to the faith. Don't take away from the faith by either your words or your actions. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's all there for our benefit. We can't be like the king back in Jeremiah 36, verse 23, where he took out his pocket knife or his pen knife and just removed the parts of God's word that he disliked. We can't ignore or remove any part of God's word, the faith. It will no longer be united. It will no longer be complete, in agreement, and unbroken. You know, the original manuscripts came uh, directly from the mind of God. And the 
it just reminds us that every bit that is complete is complete, is accurate, and as long as it's translated correctly, then we have the very words of God in our in our Bibles. Of course, that means that we need to pay attention to what we use for God's Word. Now, now what I mean by that is, is the so-called translation that you're using, is it a, a valid translation? Is it a dependable translation? We need to, need to do a little research before we purchase a Bible to, to see how that came about. What's their uh, method of translating? And see if it's something that you can depend on. Make sure that you can trust it to be God's Word. How can there be unity of the faith if the rule book changes? You know, here a few years ago, there was a so-called translation that came out which promoted the all of life is worship false doctrine, uh, as well as several other false doctrines. Do you think that promoted the unity of the faith? How about the disunity of the faith? And by the way, that's a very popular book today, and I say book, not Bible. We must keep the faith intact, complete, unchanged. Pay attention to what you're using and calling God's Word. And of course, that implies that you need to, you must know the Scriptures. Uh, that goes without saying, but how can you even recognize the faith without being very familiar with Scripture? And not just a passing acquaintance, but very familiar. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, the, um, it says, Study or be diligent to prove yourself, show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life, and godliness, all things, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And of course, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But not only are we to know the faith, we're to teach it. Nehemiah chapter 8, and verse 8, Ezra there, along with the, the help of the priests and Levites, it says, read the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Boy, that's the very definition of a preacher, isn't it? In Acts 8 and 30, Philip asked the, the Ethiopian there, said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian answered in verse 31, said, how can I except some man should guide me? See, we like Philip and Ezra have a responsibility to teach the unlearned. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What are we to teach? That body of truth whereby they may be saved. The faith. And what about prayer? Think about what we can do for the, for the church in general, for our congregations in particular but in maintaining the faith. What about prayer? Like Jesus, we should pray for the unity of all believers and pray that the teaching of the truth, the faith, will prosper. That that seed will fall on good and honest hearts and grow to maturity. I think sometimes we underestimate the power of prayer and underuse it. James chapter 5 reminds us the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, how does love fit into this discussion? Very simple as this. We must have a love for the Godhead. It's easier to love someone who loves us when we re realize that the great love of God has for us, it should motivate us to, to love him. Romans 5 and 8, he commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus reveals the extent of that love that we should have for the Godhead when he says, you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, 
and with all thy strength, Mark 12, 30. We demonstrate agape love when we keep God's commandments. Jesus said, he that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. John 14 and 21. Then you drop on down to chapter 14, verse 24, and he says, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Secondly, we are to have a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our brothers for one another here in this auditorium, as well as those faithful brethren worldwide. We should have, as Romans 12, verse 9 and 10, we referenced earlier, um, let love be without dissimulation. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another in brotherly love, preferring one another. We should be, when a brother is hurting, we should be hurting. When they're rejoicing, we should be rejoicing. That's the way it is with family. And Christians should be known, should have the reputation for loving one another. The community should know us by our actions and by our words. And if you're bad-mouthing the congregation or the preacher or the elders or whatever, don't think that's going to go unnoticed in the community. You need to show the love that you should have for the Lord's church. And finally, we must have a love for our fellow man. Jesus gave us the second commandment, the love that we should have for all of those around about us, not just those in the Lord's church. He says, the second commandment, Mark 12 and 31, is likened to it, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And you know, our priority as a Christian should be the same as Christ was in Luke chapter 19, where it says, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. So we have that responsibility put on us to seek and save the lost and if we have no love for our fellow man we won't be interested in seeking and saving their souls so as we bring this to a conclusion <laughs> you have up above me there Colossians three seventeen, I believe yes the, um, whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We've said that, glue, that love is the glue that holds together that body of truth we call the faith. And that's true. But so does the authority of God and His Word. Our Lord Jesus Christ revealed that you and I can know the truth in John 8 and 32. And the only unity pleasing to God must be based upon His inspired Word. Anything less than that is not acceptable. God's love promoted him, prompted him to give mankind an authoritative standard by which we must all wholeheartedly comply with in every term of that standard. We cannot forsake the truth, the faith, for any form of unity. Now, if you're truly a Christian, if you've been baptized for remission of your sins, you have an obligation to treat the Word of God with reverence and to give diligence to keep and maintain the unity of the faith and to do it with love in your hearts for God, for the brotherhood, and for mankind. Today, as we go through the uh, rest of these lessons, you will see how the Ones in Ephesians 4, verse 3 through 6, form that cohesive, cohesive unit we call the faith, the gospel, the truth. And only through the faith can we learn how to be saved and remain saved and enjoy that unity expressed to us in Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thank you. We could not have started this day of the study of unity demanded by Christ with any better lesson than we've just heard. We appreciate, Brother Weldon, your efforts and your knowledge of the Bible and your continued practice of the same. J.D., you might want to get around and open everything up and we'll dismiss in just a second. Regarding zeal, 
You reminded me of one time listening to old brother Gus Nichols, who's been dead for a long time now. He said he listened to a preacher preach and said the material he presented was excellent. Said it was organized so well and it was delivered where you could understand it if you wanted to. But he said he lacked one thing. He said somebody needed to just cram a hornet's nest down over his head so that he would demonstrate some of the zeal that ought to be behind the preaching of the Word of God. <laughs> well, I think that's an illustration that goes along with the kind that Brother Weldon used. And there ought to be enthusiasm, a scriptural enthusiasm, a scriptural fervency and zeal. And if we employ that agape of 1 Corinthians 13, then we will have a zeal to take the gospel of the lost. I say this about the Huntsville congregation, Fish Hatchery Road. They have always been concerned trying to reach those outside the church, trying to do their part in preaching the gospel of Christ to every creature. We all need to do that because without that disposition of heart, then what we're studying here today from Ephesians 4 won't have to very much because that set out in Ephesians 4 is God's platform for unity, the unity he demands. And it's particular planks making up that platform. And throughout the day in the other lectures coupled with this one, we will see that discussed. Again, we're thankful for your being here. Be sure 